In this episode of How It Was, we will tell you about the oldest mafia groups in Italy. How did the mafia emerge? Where do the most dangerous clans operate? And how does the mafia help regular Italians? Let's go. The oldest and most powerful criminal syndicates in Italy appeared in the south of the country in the early 19th century. The region was ruled by the Bourbon dynasty at the time. They were not doing a good job. Most people lived in poverty. And as you know, if there's poverty, crime is likely to follow. Naples was one of the largest cities in Europe at the time. This is where the oldest criminal syndicate in Italy, Camorra, originates from. The first mention of the Camorra as a criminal gang dates back to the mid-19th century, although the word had been used earlier. By that time, the group already controlled Naples' prisons and poor areas. In prison, the Camorrists engaged in extortion, smuggling and contract assassination, while the guards weren't even trying to stop the mayhem. The situation was not very different in the city either. Arrogant thugs paraded up and down the streets, collecting tribute from vendors, cabbies and prostitutes. The Camorra enjoyed so much power that the Bourbon government started hiring the criminals to work in the police. Representatives of the Italian unification movement too had to enlist the support of these street criminals. After the expulsion of the Bourbons, the Camorrists were recruited into the newly created National Guard. They used their new status for extortion. When the local police chief prohibited the guardsmen from wearing their uniform during off-duty hours, the Camorrists trashed his office. A 1911 court trial, however, was almost enough to shut the lid on the entire Camorra. It all started with the investigation of the brutal killing of bandit Gennaro Cuocolo and his wife. It turned out that nearly everyone at the top of the Neapolitan underworld was involved in the murder. 30 Camorrists ended up on trial. A total sentence of all the accused amounted to 354 years in prison. The press announced that the Camorra was destroyed, even though organized crime in the region was far from over. When the Allied forces landed in southern Italy in 1943, the Camorrists quickly figured out what role they could play and established black market for food and essential goods in Naples. The Neapolitan Mafia hit the radar of the national press in 1955. Assunta Maresca, nicknamed Pupetta, Little Doll, was a widow of a Camorra boss who shot another Camorra boss in broad daylight to avenge her husband's murder. The entire world watched Pupetta's trial. People realized that the Naples underworld had never truly gone away. At the end of the 1960s, cigarette smuggling was the main source of revenue for the Camorra. In the 70s, they also started trading in drugs. Cocaine from Colombia, heroin from Afghanistan, and hashish from Morocco. Then come 1980, the south of Italy was hit by a devastating earthquake. About 40 billion US dollars was allocated for reconstruction. It would only be discovered much later that 30 billion had been stolen and the Camorra got to keep about 6 billion. In 1993, Parliamentary Anti-Mafia Commission claimed that rather than speaking of the Camorra's infiltration, penetration or conditioning, one can speak of the Camorra's merging with the local administration. Today, the Camorra still exists, even though the bosses are arrested now and then. Camorra clans also operate in other European countries and in Latin America. If the Camorra was born out of urban poverty, the Sicilian Cosa Nostra originated in the countryside. Its origin can be traced back to the ineffective reign of the Bourbons, but also to lemons. In the late 18th century, Britain, later joined by other countries, started giving citrus fruit to sailors to prevent scurvy. The demand for lemons and oranges soared. Growing lemons immediately became a highly profitable business. The climate of Sicily was perfectly suited for the task, and local farmers started growing lemon orchards en masse. Sadly, the official authorities on the island were weak, so there was nobody who could protect the orchards. The farmers were thus forced to recruit thugs to protect their work from other thugs. In the early 20th century, the demand for Sicilian lemons went down, 
but the Mafia remained. Organized crime had more power on the island than any official authorities. In 1922, Benito Mussolini came to power in Italy. The situation in the south of Italy did not work for him. He believed that all power had to be concentrated in the hands of the leader of the state and the fascist party. Mussolini launched a war against the Mafia. One of the most experienced police officers in the country, Cesare Mori, was sent to pacify Sicily. He used everything from threats and blackmail to kidnapping and torture. By 1929, many mafiosi had been killed, imprisoned, or emigrated to the United States. Mussolini and Mori were victorious. As soon as the fascists lost some of their control, though, the Sicilian dons struck back. In the year 1943, the mafiosi helped the Americans to land in Sicily. They investigated, served as guides, and ensured the loyalty of local people. The Allies coordinated their effort with the Mafia through the Italian diaspora in the United States. After the war, the Cosa Nostra was stronger than ever. In the 1950s, the Cosa Nostra's main source of revenue was real estate fraud and control over freight traffic and markets. Later, another lucrative business emerged. The Sicilian mafiosi set up heroin smuggling into the United States. Mafia families began to fight for profits from drug trafficking. In 1962, the first Mafia war broke out in Sicily among different Mafia clans. On June the 30th, 1963, a bomb exploded in a suburb of Palermo. The explosive was intended for the boss of a Mafia family. But the explosion killed seven police and military officers who had arrived on site to defuse the bomb, following up on an anonymous tip. The story caught the eye of the public and the authorities alike. Within two months, over a thousand mafiosi were arrested, many fleeing abroad. The Cosa Nostra recovered from the blow only in the 1970s. And then, the second mafia war broke out in the early 80s. Having accumulated enough power, the peasant mafia Corleonesi was meticulously destroying their urban rivals in Palermo. Over three years, about a thousand members of the organized crime group were killed in the island capital. In response to the Mafia War, member of the parliament Pio Latore proposed to amend the criminal code in 1981. Silence, witness killings and corruption made it difficult to prove the Mafia's involvement in specific crimes. However, with La Torre's amendments, membership in the Mafia would constitute a crime in itself. The Italian Parliament passed the amendments to the Criminal Code in September 1982. Six months earlier, La Torre had been killed by the Mafia. It was informants who helped to uncover a scheme of drug trafficking across the Atlantic. Members of the losing clans in the Second Mafia War testified in exchange for personal protection. That's how the intricate scheme developed by the Cosa Nostri came to light. Let's do some counting. The Mafia purchased raw opium from Turkish suppliers for 6,000 US dollars per kilo. It would then be used in underground labs in Sicily to produce heroin. Sold wholesale in the United States, a kilo of the drug could cost as much as 185,000 US dollars. Divided up into individual packages, the same kilo could bring 1 million US dollars of revenue. The Mafia sold significant amounts of heroin in the United States through its own chain of pizza places. The same pizza places were used for money laundering. However, American investigators managed to pull the plug on this. In Sicily, though, putting the mafiosi on trial was way more challenging. Cases against organized crime were often suspended because the lead investigator would be killed. The problem was resolved through teamwork of several magistrates. In 1986, the cases of the so-called anti-mafia pool were brought together in one trial. 475 people at once were accused of murder, drug trafficking, kidnapping, racketeering, and participation in mafia organizations. Among the defendants were stars of the criminal community. In the trial, 360 people were found guilty, 19 mafia bosses, and the most prolific hitman received life sentences. The boss of the Corleonesi family, Salvatore Riina, escaped arrest. However, a life sentence in absentia deprived him of the opportunity to use his accumulated wealth. In 1993, he was finally caught and sent to prison. 
the leaders of the Sicilian Mafia are still getting caught today. This lovely elderly man is the boss of the Cosa Nostra Settimo Mineo. He was arrested in 2018 in a major sweep in Palermo. Give a thumbs up to the Italian Carabinieri. Sicilian's neighbor on the toe of the Italian boot is a region called Calabria, which is home of another criminal syndicate, the Endrangheta. Ironically, it was people from the poorest area in Italy who organized one of the richest criminal syndicates in the world. Here's how they succeeded. It so happened that the poor people of Calabria had limited ways to earn money. They could tend to cattle in the mountains for peanuts, but smuggling, kidnapping and commission murder were much more lucrative endeavors. The Andrangheta is based on the so-called Andrina. An Andrina is a family connected not only by family ties, but also by a vow of silence about each other's crimes. The head of the family was usually the oldest man, but if he was in prison or killed, his wife could take over the business. And Andrina's strength was in loyalty and mobility. Families emigrated and quickly infiltrated the new regions. The Andrangheta was only able to get into Canada, Germany, Colombia, Australia and the Netherlands thanks to these tiny cells doing their job. The families act independently, but their interests may overlap during criminal operations since there are over 120 Andrinas in Calabria alone. If that happens, they have to unite into locales, groups of 50 people. A locale has its own staff of accountants, assassins, and most importantly, negotiators who resolve conflicts. This is essential due to blood feuds being a matter of honor in Southern Italy. Members of the Andrangheta were the first Europeans to start trading directly with Pablo Escobar's cartel to ship pure cocaine across the Atlantic at no extra cost. After Escobar was arrested, they switched to Mexico. The Andrangheta was also the first gang to form its own merchant fleet and its own submarine for transporting cocaine. The Calabrians would import up to 12 tons of cocaine every year controlling up to 80% of the cocaine traffic in Europe. Interestingly, the Andrangheta invests some of this money into right-wing politicians. There is information that the group supports Lega Nord, or Northern League, which is currently one of the biggest factions in the Italian parliament. As of 2007, the annual income of the Calabrian criminal syndicate constituted 40 billion euros, and it has probably grown by now. However, in 2010, the Mafia took a hard hit. One of its leaders, Giovanni Tagano, was arrested. The police had been after him for 17 years. When he was going to prison from the courtroom, a crowd of supporters followed the escort. The cartel was not defeated, however. It consists of thousands of brothers and sisters, parents and children united by blood and vows. When the official authorities cannot handle the situation, there is always a parallel structure emerging in their place. During the coronavirus epidemic and the lockdown, representatives of the criminal syndicates in the south of Italy started to give out food to people who were out of work. The media are warning that the Mafia is using the situation in their favor to gain even more influence. What do you guys think? Which Mafia group is the strongest one today? Tell us in the comments section. If you like this video, click thumbs up and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss new episodes of How It Was.